So my name is Michael Steinberg. I'm the Vice Provost for the Arts here at Brown. And it's an extremely pleasurable duty for me to uh, welcome all of you to the opening of what I know will be a very exciting day for us. Uh, I'm going to throw out my planned introductory remarks on the basis of a conversation that the panel just had a second ago, which has produced a new vocabulary. Uh, in talking about how to introduce Sebastian and how Sebastian will introduce Michael and Adam, the two other speakers in the panel, uh, Sebastian gave us all the instruction, uh, no cavelling, please. Is there anybody here, is there anybody here who does not understand the word cavelling? <laughs> this is very important. Uh, so cavelling uh, is a word that has some importance, and it means uh, to praise, to flatter, to overdo the sugar uh, in ways that might be warranted and might not be. And we immediately came up with two more words, uh, so that that conversation was now called the proto quelling since we all objected to that instruction. Uh, and then Adam came up with the word ur quelling which of course is also a name of a beer, so that will only start later in the day. Uh, but I go through all of this to uh, make you all aware that uh, the association between Brown University and community music works is intensely important. Uh, and really has been for a large number of years because it speaks to not only the collaborative uh, uh, work and purpose of uh, a public and socially oriented and urban-based arts organization and a university. Uh, it speaks to the combination of mission and methods of the arts and the liberal arts, and it really speaks to the way both uh, education and the arts education and performance uh, are essential components of civic life and civil society. Uh, civil society was the theme of a conference that we did together with Sebastian and Community Music Works and also with the essential and very generous support of the Mellon Foundation. Uh, that was a number of years ago. It was a very important moment for all of us. So to some extent, this is a revisiting of that theme uh, with a new uh, student body, uh, a new uh, group of musicians, uh, and a new uh, group from uh, Community Music Works. So it's really a great pleasure to, uh, to uh, revisit that. Uh, the training of musicians, uh, the training of doctors, of lawyers, of business people, if you think of the MBA degree, uh, these forms of training uh, have an unusual combination these days because they seem to be realizing very often in ways that, out, that outpace uh, the university's internal realization of the same issue. Uh, these modes of training uh, have been realizing that they all need to reground themselves uh, in modes of education uh, and that there's a difference between education and training uh, education is a much broader, a much deeper, and ultimately a more inchoate, less economically measurable uh, mode of interaction than training, so that education includes training in these fields, but has to be bigger than training. Uh, and from the university point of view, education uh, has also been broadening, so that what we do inside the classroom has to be related to what goes on outside the classroom. And for these reasons, among many others, this kind of collaboration is really essential because it shows us how to do everything, uh, just as music really teaches us not only about music, but also how to do everything else, how to talk to each other, how to build community, uh, how to excel technically. Uh, all of these things are related in ways that have not always been recognized. So for all of these reasons, and for Sebastian's, I'm now disobeying your instruction, uh, for really Sebastian's uh, unparalleled role in uh, building a program that uh, honors these principles. Uh, this is an enormously important day, and uh, you are all an essential part of it. So welcome, and I'll now hand things over to Sebastian, and we'll go on from there. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. Well, that was, that was the um, proto greeting. Good morning. Um, so, a as Michael said, this is, a, this is an exciting kind of second chapter uh, of a conversation that we started together in uh, 2011 with Music and Civil Society. So, I am uh, grateful to this uh, collaboration with Michael Steinberg and this uh, unfolding set of ideas and conversations. 
Um, the, uh, uh, I'll, I'm just here to give a quick introduction to our other two colleagues, and then I'll come back and uh, speak a little bit more about the themes of the day. Um, I have had the, uh, the privilege and the inspiration over the last uh, couple of years to get to know the um, sort of burgeoning work of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture. Adam Horowitz will tell you more about that in a moment. Um, but uh, I um, have never been one of those musicians who put stickers on their viola case. I just sort of thought, you know, I'm just not a sticker on a viola case kind of person. Um, until I saw the stickers for the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and I thought, damn, that's a really nice sticker. So, um, so that's how I feel about the inspirational value of this effort. Um, uh, Adam's title at the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture is Chief Instigator. Uh, he, uh, full bios are in your program, but I'll just pull out a few things that I, I think are um, uh, worthy of a, a quick note. Um, Adam uh, trained at Yale University. Actually, he was educated at Yale University. Um, and, uh, and has been working at this intersection of arts education and social change for um, many years since, um, working uh, in part with organizations like Ashoka, the Bowery Arts and Sciences, the Future Project, and others. He's been a Fulbright scholar, um, uh, working at the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics as an artist in residence. And, uh, and let's welcome Adam to give us an introduction to this important exhibit. All right, thank you, Sebastian. Good morning. Good morning. OK, let's see who's in the room. Who here considers themselves an artist? Who here considers themselves creative? Who is intimidated by the word artist? Mm -hmm. Who here uh, cares about where they live? Who here has dreamt that the world could be other than it is? <laughs> Great. So it looks like everyone here is qualified to be a part of the US Department of Arts and Culture. Now, you might not have heard of the USDAC before. It's OK. We're not a federal agency. Unlike most countries, many countries in the world, the US doesn't have a department level position for arts and culture. So we made our own. Uh, it's a grassroots action network of artists and others committed to cultivating empathy, equity, and social imagination. We started with this core question of how can we move art and culture from the margins to the center of civil society, as Michael said, given their true value and support as catalysts for social transformation. And that's a hard task in a country in which we spend more than twice the national endowment for the arts budget every day on war, and in which you know, uh, I think kids in the US have about a quarter of the arts education time as kids in other UNESCO countries. So as Sun Ra has said, we have tried everything possible and none of it has worked. Now we must try the impossible. For the last two years, we've been flirting with the impossible. Uh, we started with, with interviews with practitioners, policymakers all around the country and found that there was a real need to create connective tissue to help uh, amplify the community of practice of amazing artists who are doing deep community-based work, but not just connect them, connect them so that we can take action together for policies and programs that can advance this work and to do it differently. So we consider the US Department of Arts and Culture a large-scale performance. We launched with a press conference and little more than a statement of values and a set of buttons and stickers. Um, statement of values. Culture is a human right. Culture is created by everyone. Cultural diversity is a social good and the wellspring of free expression. The work of artists is a powerful resource for community development, education, healthcare, and other democratic public purposes. So we launched with a press conference, and a week later, we were denounced by the conservative pundit, Glenn Beck, who knew we weren't a federal agency, but said, I guarantee you, with what they have just started, if you don't have an equal and opposite reaction, then in five years, the country is gone with no chance of resetting. So we're two years in, folks. Help us get there. Um, we put out a call for founding cultural agents. We were looking for artists, for educators, for organizers who understand the role of art in community development, who are already doing it where they are, but who you know, were interested in stepping up and doing it with others as part of a national network. We hoped 10 people would sign up. 
We were overwhelmed with more than 100 applications for the first round, chose this cohort of agents, and began a six-month online training program in things like creative facilitation, community asset mapping, um, cultural policy, all leading to what we call imaginings. So imaginings are large-scale, arts-infused community dialogues in which neighbors come together using the arts to envision 20 years out when mission is accomplished for the USDAC in our community, what does that look like? When art is fully embedded in the fabric of society, what does that look like and how do we get there? As Bernice Johnson Reagan from Sweet Honey and the Rock says, when you begin to imagine and act as if you live in the world you want to live in, you will have company. And sure enough, we've now, we're in our third cohort of cultural agents. More than 10,000 people have come together in more than 40 states to take part in imaginings and the other programs that we do. Abandon all hopelessness, you who enter here. <laughs> so the point is not just to do these one-off events, of course. The idea is that if there's enough energy in the sites that we activate, folks can open field offices. Most are not actual physical places, but this one in Lawrence, Kansas is, um, for ongoing projects to further the visions that, that came out of the imagining. Now we're trying to connect the local grassroots with national policy, and that's where amazing people like Sebastian Ruth come in, the Secretary of uh, Music and Society with the USDAC. This is our national cabinet, policymakers, practitioners, leaders of wonderful organizations. What we're doing now is beginning to look at the patterns emerging across sites from small towns to big cities at the imaginings, and then think about policy that we could develop and roll out at the local or state, or maybe we'll even propose things at the federal level. There's more uh, energy and hunger than, than we can even kind of contain. So instead of just the applications for cultural agents, we also do large scale national actions that anyone anywhere can take part in like the people say to the union. Um, so the idea is that once a year, the president gives a State of the Union address. But what if we took that moment to talk amongst ourselves, right? Because democracy is a conversation, not a monologue. So we invite anyone to host story circles. We do online trainings for how to host story circles, give toolkits. And here in, in, in more than 150 different communities, folks came together to share personal stories reflecting on the state of our union. We upload these stories online, and then that serves as inspiration for an amazing group of poets who then uh, draw from those stories to compose the poetic address to the nation, which we broadcast out. And we just wrapped that project up uh, this past week in Philadelphia. Things like that, and things like Dare to Imagine, uh, where we invited, we invited anyone to step up as an emissary from the future to activate social imagination in their communities. So the kinds of folks we have signing up to do this aren't just artists, they are social justice organizations, they are schools, they are homeless shelters, they are uh, universities, theater groups, et cetera. Um, and again, we kind of give these creative techniques, methodologies for activating social imagination in communities. So that is all just the beginning, folks. We're, we're only two years in, there's a lot to do. Um, and I invite all of you to enlist as a citizen artist. You do not need to be a US citizen or an artist to be a citizen artist with the USDAC. Just someone who's committed to helping spark this, this movement to cultivate empathy, equity, and social imagination. Thank you so much. And uh, if you want a sticker, I'm sure Adam can arrange stickers, yes. right? It's a good logo, right? Um, I was uh, intending to make two introductions at once, but I forgot. So I'm going to now uh, introduce my friend and colleague, Michael Yaffe, uh, who is, um, for in his entire career, has been a force in the community arts and arts education world uh, in many different contexts, as you'll see in his bio. Um, Michael currently serves as the Associate Dean of the Yale School of Music, where he um, has uh, uh, developed the Music in Schools Initiative. And um, this is a really, I, I think, bold effort, and I've been privileged to, to play a small part in it, um, that really kind of transforms conservatory students' experience at an elite institution um, from being very kind of me focused to understanding what does it mean to be at this elite institution in the context of a diverse city and how 
as musicians, can we play roles in the city? And so um, you can learn more about that from Michael uh, later in the day if you like, but, uh, but essentially a quarter of the conservatory students are out in the New Haven Public Schools um, learning to become teaching artists uh, as part of their work. Uh, and uh, as you know from the framing of this conference, um, uh, Michael Steinberg had invited me to, to think about an event at Brown that would help to launch the um, online course I just did, but this was developed um, through, uh, through a, uh, work at the Yale School of Music, and so I invited Michael Yaffe to be an emissary from New Haven to, uh, to introduce a, a little bit of the work they're doing. rule, but I will say I had a rather distinctive experience two weeks ago when uh, Sebastian was kind enough to bring his father to meet me. And we had, and I'm not going to tell you anything that we said because that would break the rule, but I want you to know that, that not only did Sebastian's dad and I fell about him, <laughs> but we had an, a small email exchange in which that felling continued. So. I feel like we ha I, I've not broken the rule, but clearly um, I've let everyone know where this all fits in. So that's the end of it, I promise, no more. <laughs> um, the Yale School of Music is, um, is a professional music school in the context of a great university. Um, for those of you who don't know the details of it, we have uh, about 200 students um, in performance and composition. Um, so we're a professional training institution in the context of a great liberal arts university. And um, about uh, 10 years ago, um, a Yale College class, for reasons that I still don't fully understand, but I am thrilled that they did this, um, identified um, their 50th anniversary gift to Yale, that they wanted to give it to the School of Music so we could try um, to recreate music education in America, that we could have a national impact on the conversation, and that we could um, work in New Haven, that we could have conversations about uh, the role that the arts play in, in community. And out of that uh, came uh, a very large program in New Haven in which, as Sebastian said, about um, a quarter of our students, could be more, but at about a quarter of our students, are integrally involved in partnering with public school music teachers because New Haven is rather distinctive as an urban school district in that it still has a whole infrastructure of music teachers. So it's given us a real advantage over some of the other programs that have had to exist in, uh, in urban settings in which there wasn't the opportunity uh, to partner with a professional music teacher in the schools. So we've taken advantage of that to, you, to, to help train our students and to um, provide New Haven kids with um, opportunities to, uh, to do music at a level that they wouldn't be able to do just in the context of their individual school. It's an area that we're really quite proud of and it connects um, to, to the overall vision of, uh, of the School of Music at this point. Um, we talk at the school a lot about um, that we would like our great musicians to be cultural leaders and um, I think this program um, embodies the concept that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to accomplish through that. Um, tied to it is we also host um, a symposium every two years in which we, um, we have, it's sort of evolved over the years, but the last one was actually a, um, an invitational um, conference in which we brought partnerships together, public school and arts partners together to New Haven to spend a few days um, to, to talk really about a, the concepts that we're trying to develop in New Haven, but more importantly, how this can be a national conversation, as we all know that it is in a very constructive way all over the place. But, but at the School of Music, we want to be part of that to the level that we can. Um, out of that, um, we also have had a lot of discussions about how we want to train musicians and our students, um, many of them will go on to university teaching jobs or they'll go on to orchestras or they'll, uh, we have a great composition department. So I mean, they're, they're, they'll, they'll probably be able to be in the profession in some way. But, how, but we've thought a lot and talked a lot about how 
um, we can help our students while they're here think about the kinds of things we, that they can do beyond just playing their instrument or composing a new work, but how they particularly c create a connect to the world around them. And what, um, what came out of that is that while uh, at our school, you know, we do what all the other great conservatories do, we've got entrepreneurial studies, we're trying to, the Music in Schools Initiative is a great uh, training program for kids who want to do programs in, in, with public schools. But we haven't really, we hadn't really addressed what we felt was probably the most important thing, which is why you should do this. And um, that, to me, is the key for, uh, for what we've done and why we brought Sebastian on the train every Monday from New Haven for the last few years to, to teach a course for us that is the basis of the Coursera that we're going to talk about shortly. Um, we, we really, uh, I, I oh, wait a minute, how do I do this without breaking my rule about Savannah? Um, <laughs> we've had visiting professors as part of the Music in Schools initiative, and, um, but we were looking for someone who could try to address the idea of why. Uh, why you should do this, because it's fine to say, you know, here's how you work with a young kid, here's how you become a teaching artist, uh, you know, here's the, uh, how you write a, a, a grant to, to, do a, to do a foundation grant or something like that, but we wanted our kids to think about historical, sociological, philosophical reasons about why music can have an impact on the world beyond the concert hall and the practice room. And so um, uh, I, I heard Sebastian speak, um, and understood that he was someone who'd be able to help us at the school um, create a course that would allow our students to think about that. The exciting thing about it is it's expanded its scope in some ways as far as school of music is concerned because it's one of the courses um, that undergraduates take and that students um, from other professional schools within Yale uh, take as well, and that is an added treat to us. So when we were approached at the idea of doing um, a Coursera class, um, we, we thought a lot about it in, in the administration, and you know, there, there are a lot of courses about you know, how to um, work on the, uh, the passage of um, you know, the, 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 the 18 measure uh, uh, audition section that you'll need to do in order to be able to successfully audition for an orchestra. There's a lot of great uh, master classes and other things like that. But immediately we came around to the idea that the, the work that Sebastian's doing and the class that he was doing is exactly how the School of Music can enter the conversation um, both um, within Yale, well within the school, but within Yale and within, within the country and, and the world for that matter with Coursera. So it was almost a no-brainer that um, we approached Sebastian about the idea of um, uh, releasing him from the class for one semester so that he could create this. And so it's very much in keeping with, um, with our idea, and I, I have a feeling your idea, about the role of artists uh, beyond uh, beyond the traditional way that, that we all do our art. Um, and so that's the, the premise behind why, why Yale did this and why we're so excited. I heard this morning that there are already like 7,000 hits on the uh, Coursera class thing on YouTube, so it's already making an impact. So uh, it, it, it's, it's really exciting. And, and that's the premise behind it, Sebastian. And so um, that's my introduction to, um, to actually to, to why we thought why was important. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to close the screen for a minute, DJ. I don't know if that's going to take our screen away. Um, so. What I'm planning to, to do in the um, next few minutes is um, give a little bit of an introduction to the set of ideas um, that I've been working with in developing this online class. Um, and then I'll uh, end with a short clip uh, that uh, represents the class with the hope that if it's compelling and interesting, you'll uh, seek it out and sign up. Um, <clears throat> but I'm also going to try to frame the issues of today. Uh, because as we were planning this, this day, uh, as, as you know from the program, we've invited a, a number of 
really wonderful and inspiring colleagues whose work in very different ways addresses this question of the connection between arts and social action. When we did the Music and Civil Society conference a few years ago, um, in the middle of the conference, one of our uh, panelists um, kind of took a time out and said, we haven't spent enough time defining what we really mean by civil society. And with that kind of um, thought in mind, uh, I, I thought it would be useful to spend a minute on what is social action? What do we really mean by social action? And, um, and why are we framing it in this way? I think that the, um, the sort of classical definition is important, that we're talking about an intentional activity um, with a group of people, importantly. It's a, it's a group action, not a s solo action, uh, that seeks a particular outcome. And in, the, and in the case that we're dealing with, I, I think I can speak for everyone here, uh, the outcome we're looking for is a just society. And that means a lot of different things. Um, but an intentional activity with a group of people aiming toward a more just society. So the, the question is, in this pairing of art and social action, are we talking about art as a vehicle toward this other end? Are we talking about something um, intrinsic in the artistic experience that gets us there, not necessarily in this kind of instrumental way, but inherent in the activity of making or perceiving art, something changes in our society? So I think those are important and unanswered questions. But I, I want to just break, break apart um, a couple of ways we might think about this. So one is the... Um, explicit content in a piece of art. So art as social action, right? And there are uh, examples of protest songs or uh, posters that are raising awareness about a particular issue. So the art piece itself is trying to accomplish some change. And then there's the situational or what I'm choosing to call situational artistic initiative uh, that is not necessarily explicit in the content, right? That says it's about where you choose to take this uh, artistic action, with whom, under what circumstances. And in the, in the course, uh, the online course, um, we spend a little time with both scenarios. So in the classical music tradition, we have uh, exemplars like Pablo Casals, the great cellist, or Branislav Huberman, a very important violinist from the first part of the 20th century, who dedicated a portion of their careers at, at a certain point, actually for both of them in the 30s, to humanitarian issues, and in the case of Casals as a very proud Catalan uh, uh, citizen, decided that it was his work to found an orchestra um, to celebrate the early stages of the Spanish Republic and this democracy, and then when the fascists came in to dedicate the next period of his life, and in some ways the rest of his life and career, to fighting the fascists, uh, resisting at first in Barcelona, then going into exile and, and literally laying down the cello and doing his, uh, devoting all of his energy to raise international awareness about the refugee crisis, refugees from the Spanish Civil War. And then remaining in exile for the rest of his life, he said he would not go back and live in Spain uh, while Franco was, was in power. And, uh, and sort of using the platform of being an internationally renowned artist to meet with heads of state and raise this issue continually, but also to play concerts for peace. And he, he made this um, oratorio that he tried to play in 50, I think he wound up in 50 countries um, that was a call for, for peace. Huberman worked with um, uh, 
it, to, to get Jews out of Nazi-occupied Europe in the 30s and to found the Palestine Symphony, which would later become the Israel Philharmonic. Um, again, sort of devoting his entire energy and concert career to this cause and really uh, becoming, in a way, a public intellectual at that time, using the platform of his fame as a violinist to say, no, it's not okay to have these Jewish cultural organizations in Germany once the Jews had been kicked out of the main cultural institutions. He said, this, he said um, the writing on the, is on the wall. It's going to get worse. We have to create artistic positions for these people in other places. Um, so in some ways, I, I think of these, although the music they were playing was not necessarily explicitly uh, connected to the cause, the actions were direct and explicit. In the situational context, we have efforts like Community Music Works and the uh, other colleague organizations here in, in town, New Urban Arts and Everett and Matten Avenue Project, City Arts, um, AS220 Youth, where it's, it's about, who, in some cases, what is the content of our art? How are we working with young people <laughs> to make art that responds to social issues of our city and of our day? And, but at another level, it is situational. It's about um, where are we locating? How are we creating a different um, open door to uh, communities who have been marginalized and who may not have access to uh, high quality arts, mentorship, and, and instruction. And as we go through the day today, you'll hear from uh, Heidi Upton and Karen Zorn, who are gonna talk about educational uh, initiatives in higher ed that are trying to introduce people to a sort of civic practice uh, with an artistic practice. Uh, we'll hear from Robbie McCauley and actually see a performance that Robbie will do that uh, I think really, um, importantly sort of bridges this question of is it about the content or is it about the questions it raises. Um, and then in the last part of the day, um, my colleague Chloe Klein will speak about a particular effort at Community Music Works to think about the importance of place and, and concerts situated in place. Um, and Nabil Abu Dashkar will uh, represent his work in Nazareth um, in, in Israel. And the um, uh, the work of bridging divides and making an important, strong identity through musical experience. But the other frame that the online class tries to explore and that I'll just sort of introduce here is you know, into what context do the current initiatives uh, fit? And particularly, um, we go back to John Dewey and uh, I like this cover. For those of you who think of this as a Bible, you know what I mean. Um, 1934 text, Art as Experience, uh, in, in which do we really takes the sort of philosopher's project of starting from scratch and saying, how do we even think about a philosophy of art? How do we think uh, about the meaning of art in human experience? And starts by saying that art is a human impulse, comes from a human impulse, and it's an impulse to find order and meaning in our world, in a basically chaotic existence. Um, and I think in a, in a sort of, again, a helpful sort of philosopher's practice, he brings it back down to an entirely understandable concept, and he says, like a dog, who is restless because it is hungry uh, and everything is in a kind of um, disorder between the animal and its environment because of this need, this hunger, is fed, goes to sleep, there's this order achieved between the creature and its environment. And he says, actually, as, as humans, this is our continual uh, loop. We're, we're constantly going in and out of a sense of harmony with our environment. Uh, and this is, you know, he, he talks in language which I think we might now think of as kind of mindfulness or um, there's the, there's the um, a psychologist Csikszentmihalyi who talks about that experience of flow, of being in perfect kind of um, 
sync with your environment uh, where you kind of let the past and the future drop away and you're fully present in the moment you're in. Dewey talks about this sense of order as kind of the basis of artistic expression. He says it's fundamentally the artist is constantly taking all of the information from self, from environment, uh, and trying to distill it into some sense of what does this mean? How is this? How, how am I creating a sense of order? And then he also goes to the experience of the listener or the viewer and says, in fact, as a viewer coming into contact with art, if we put the, uh, an intense personal energy into our viewing, we also can get that experience of alignment. So both the artist creates this alignment for him or herself, and the viewer might find that alignment from, from uh, encountering a work of art. Um, Heidi, in a few minutes, will talk more about that aesthetic uh, experience. But, but then Dewey, um, Dewey makes it bigger, because he says, actually, the experience of digesting the world and putting an imaginative energy um, into the experience of what we see around us makes art actually better positioned than religion to establish the, um, the principles we can, we can live by and move, and move forward. And he says, um, the primacy of the imagination extends far beyond the scope of direct personal relationships. Uh, sorry, let me back up. Imagination, he says, is the chief instrument of the good. It is more or less a commonplace to say that a person's ideas and treatment of his fellows are dependent upon his power to put himself imaginatively in their place. So that idea of empathy, how do you put yourself imaginatively in someone else's place? But the primacy of the imagination extends far beyond the scope of direct personal relationships, except where ideal is used in conventional deference or as a name for a sentimental reverie, the ideal factors in every moral outlook and human loyalty are imaginative. The historic allegiance of religion and art has its roots in this common quality, and here's his punchline. Hence it is that art is more moral than moralities. For the latter, and he's talking about moralities, um, like the, the principles of a religion, for the latter either are or tend to become consecrations of the status quo, reflections of custom, reinforcements of the established order. But art has been the means of keeping alive the sense of purposes that outrun evidence and of meanings that transcend indurated habit. Art is that force that keeps us questioning, that keeps us looking in a fresh way that keeps us imagining different possibilities. So Dewey puts this much larger frame, right, than just the sort of individual artistic experience. And another, another angle that I explore in this class is examples from the past where some of these ideas were, were put into practice, and in particular, the New Deal federal arts programs. Uh, which may, many of you may know this, I, I didn't, that um, the uh, architects, administrators of some of the New Deal art programs were going to Dewey's lectures in the 30s and listening to Dewey <coughs> claim the power of the artistic experience in our civilization and saying actually, you know, Roosevelt is putting, up, putting us to this task of how can we restore the spirit of the nation, and let's, let's do this through um, bold arts programs. So in one way, this, this inquiry into the New Deal is just to say what was the ideology of these people at the time to assume that art would have the potential uh, to restore an ailing country um, in spirit, in provoking dialogue, in making meaning in, uh, in the world around. Some of the most visible and maybe um, uh, knowable artifacts from the New Deal programs are the uh, murals that are still in the public buildings. Uh, and Diego Rivera, for instance, you know, was funded to do many of these important murals. We see them still in some post offices and schools. Uh, 
how do we make art visible, how do we put artists back to work in the Depression. But there were many other projects that I think were equally important. One of them was giving stipends to studio artists who didn't have to paint on the walls of buildings, but were really given a federal stipend to, to produce work because uh, the rationale was very much rooted in Dewey's thinking. It is the artists who are going to digest this chaotic situation of the world, digest the news, and, um, and bring some sense of meaning and, and, and order. So one of the iconic examples some of you may have seen uh, was Jacob Lawrence's um, uh, series, the migration series that was just reassembled in an exhibit at MoMA last year. Um, where he chronicled the migration of African Americans from the South to, to the North and into cities with little captions um, in, in each sort of describing the conditions of urban life when um, African Americans were coming into the Northern cities. Um, sort of a document of the time, a document of his own experience, but, uh, but an artistic document, right? One that even today as we look, we can sort of imaginatively enter into the sociological phenomenon of that time. And there were orchestras. There were um, federal uh, arts, federal music project orchestras that started. The um, uh, Providence had its own. The Providence, uh, I forget, was it Providence Civic Orchestra or something, um, that performed what I think is uh, so uh, uh, sort of wonderfully symmetrical with the work that we're trying to do with community music works, performed in the middle school and high school auditoriums of Providence. So you look at these concert programs, the orchestra was composed, comprised of the same musicians who were playing in the normal professional orchestra, but they reassembled for these concerts that took place in the Hope High School Auditorium, in the Gilbert Stewart Auditorium, the Roger Williams uh, Middle School Auditorium. And, uh, and the idea was, uh, this is kind of a segue to this next point, but how do you make sure that this really important role uh, for the arts is accessible to everyone? that you don't have to enter into these sort of palaces of art to get the benefit of the artistic experiences. Uh, and so <clears throat> alongside the orchestras and the, and the muralists and the painters, these, uh, these folks in the, in the New Deal programs also established community arts centers. And again, how, do, how, does, how does everyone have access uh, to the arts? And, how do we start to challenge, as Dewey does in this, in this book, how do we start to challenge the idea that arts, the, the, the true meaning of the artistic experience um, is going into a museum or into an opera house or into a concert hall, when in fact those structures, those buildings, were built really for, with entirely different motivations. And Dewey claims, you know, great museums are built basically to show off a collection or to claim some kind of nationalistic pride in the cultural sophistication of a country. And he said, you know, these great institutions that are built with great wealth, basically to show off uh, sophistication, are not necessarily going to bring people into that really human experience of what are the deep questions I'm dealing with? How can I engage with an art, uh, artistic work so that I have some greater insight into my own life? And um, I'll, I'll just read another quote. He says, art is often remitted to a separate realm where it is cut off from that association with the materials and aims of every other form of human effort undergoing an achievement. A primary task is thus imposed on one who tries to undertake to write on the philosophy of arts. This task is to restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are universally recognized to constitute experience. Restoring continuity, right? Say, saying that continuity was there in the inception of these works of art. It's, it really was about digesting the everyday events, but then we, we cut it off when we say art is actually this refined experience. So the last sure. point I'll make is in this effort to say, how are we putting artistic experiences in the role of moving forward some social action, 
how do we engage? How, does, how do artists um, take social action in a conscious way? And I say conscious because um, how are we conscious of issues of class, of race, of power, if we are taking action within the, the context of trying to rectify injustices? And for this, uh, we uh, turn a bit to Paolo Freire, uh, especially this classic text, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, to say in every educational moment, the educator has to be acutely aware of the possibility that an authoritarian educational mode will just further sort of ingrain systems of oppression that we're trying to break down. So he proposes this dialogical method. How do you have an educational environment that recognizes that two people, a learner and a teacher, are trying together through dialogue, through an experience together, to understand reality. And the moment we as educators decide that reality, that we know what reality is, and we fix it, and we try to present reality, we've, we've lost it, right? It's about being aware of the changing world around us through dialogue, through relationships, um, through a, a real understanding of another person's experience by continually being um, convinced that we don't have all the answers. And I kind of love the parallel between Dewey and Freire in, these, in, in this idea, right? Um, Dewey's saying it is actually through that imaginative experience of the arts that we continually understand what should be right in our world or, or what we should you know, imagine the next uh, iteration of our society. And, and Freire's saying, we can't fix it ever, it's never fixed. We have to always be in this ongoing inquiry. I'm gonna play a clip which is um, a spoiler for the Coursera because it's actually the last lecture in the whole course where um, in five minutes I make an attempt to sum up the whole course. Uh, and uh, either you'll get enough out of those five minutes to say, I'm good, I don't need to take the course, or, or maybe this will um, provoke you to, to want to look back a little bit. But really, there's, there's I guess, one more step, in, a broader step that, that I try to make with this course, um, which is to say, how do we situate this con conversation in the larger context of evolving a democracy? Taking these ideas that it's never finished, Maxine Green's idea that the community is always in the making, we don't ever uh, know, know completely the answers. How, in fact, is this experience of constantly working to understand another's experience, constantly working to collectively imagine uh, a better set of conditions, um, how is the work of art and social action really a practice of evolving a democracy? So that's how I'll cue this up. Having considered the questions in this course of civil society, aesthetic experience, regard for other, and social action, let's circle back to the question of the link between artists and a healthy, thriving democracy. As the students and I discussed, we can learn a lot from Paolo Freire and, and Robert Greenleaf about this nature of service and how we regard the public when we serve as artists how we might become more conscious of our roles when engaging in a social action or a social practice. But how does this connect to this larger question of civil society and of democracy? I want to point out a few ways I think this can happen. First, from Maxine Green, we hear the idea that regard for other is fundamental to a civil society. That for people to have rights to speech, rights to individuality, rights to the political process. They need to be seen 
in so many civil rights and equal rights movements in our country's history, the basis for the struggle is indeed invisibility. Women not being seen, African Americans not being seen, same-sex couples not being seen, not being seen as deserving the same recognition, the same legal protections as others. And in part, the problem is that regard for difference is difficult. The human impulse can so often be to reject difference because of its unfamiliarness. Maxine Green talks about making space for others, learning to listen, evaluating, and not necessarily agreeing, but learning to recognize another's right to be seen. She makes light and talks about Lady Gaga. Whether or not she likes Lady Gaga's music or her persona is not essential to recognizing Lady Gaga's right to individuality in a democracy. And that's what she draws out as so scary about fascism, that difference isn't tolerated, that some abstract idea of society would dominate and would reject difference as a fundamental threat to that theoretical notion of what's ideal. How do we practice, though, this regard for difference? What role does art play here? It, at, at one level, there is the practice of seeing the unfamiliar and trying to identify yourself with it. I remember the first time I heard the Shostakovich piano trio, for instance. I didn't know how to hear it. And I thought, I don't like this. Why would people listen to it? And sometime later, I began to learn about Shostakovich, his life, and 20th century music more generally. And I began to realize there was something in this music I could identify with and I could be fascinated by. Personal angst, passion, the eerie feeling of a kind of wicked authority. Eventually, I grew to love this music, but loving music, loving that music isn't really the point. When I look back on that initial reaction, I'm glad someone helped me to, to understand, to try to identify with it, and to try to see what it was I was, I was seeing and, and what the music was saying. And maybe that's the point. How do we grow to appreciate difference and try to make an effort to have an experience with the unfamiliar? I think there's another role for art forming healthy democracy. We've talked about the capacity to not only understand difference, but to imagine a different reality for society, to boldly engage in social imagination. How does engaging with art open us to new ways of seeing the world? There's that feeling of leaving a museum or a good concert with a different mindset than you started with, realizing that nothing is fixed and permanent, that I could rearrange my house or rearrange my routine or perhaps change the way I interact with people. These are little examples, but I think it's that moment of changed perspective, of a new insight, that I think comes from the practice of seeing things as if they could be otherwise. And beyond imagining a different future, there's that more basic idea that artists, in using their practice to see, to digest, to understand issues in the world, as Dewey describes, are leading the way for others to see the world as changeable. They're keeping a democracy evolving, keeping, as JFK described, a country or a society from becoming complacent or blind to ongoing issues of injustice that may be present. Not always it, 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 with artists by creating politically themed art, but even by what Maxine Green describes as releasing imagination. And in taking a particular stance, as we've seen with Casals and Huberman and Ai Weiwei, how can we orient the art practice to be simultaneously an aesthetic and a humanistic practice, so that the music or the art is stimulating or moving, yes, but that it comes from an intention to do some good for a human cause. And in that, as I'll reiterate here, we fulfill Dewey's idea that art and normal life are not distinct from one another. Jumping up a level, that the practice of democracy, of continually evolving a society to ensure ideals of justice and fairness and freedom is not distinct from art. The humanistic impulse of regarding others, of imagining better conditions, and of making meaning of the chaos of the world's events, all can be part of a larger definition of the work of an artist. So that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the snippet, that's the spoiler. Uh, 
you can log on to Coursera. There's a link on the, on the back of your program if you're interested to see more. Um, I think in the interest of keeping us on schedule, we won't uh, do questions and discussion now. I'm getting the five minute mark. Five minutes of questions and discussion now <laughs> uh, before going to a break. Um, so if, uh, if I could just ask this one logistical favor, as people have questions, the, we're trying to capture sound today on video, so as you have questions, raise your hand, and then a couple of folks will run and hand you a mic. Um, maybe Jenna here in the, in the front row. Thank you so much. Um, I'm guessing others are in the course, but I am and, and would urge you to do that, but that's not what I wanted to say. Um, among other things I noticed when you were talking about Dewey and order and meaning, it brought me to thinking about a woman named Judith Herman, whom some of you may know of, who does work with trauma and the need for control, connection, and meaning. And without sort of swaying us off course, it makes me think about not only social action as you've uh, thought about it, but also the other deep connections that we're, we're aware of. And I just wanted to thank you for making that clear as well. Judith Herman. Thank you. So the book is uh, Trauma and Recovery. Trauma and Recovery. Yep. Thank you, Janet. And uh, if folks are in the middle, if you don't mind sort of walking out toward the aisle, if you have a question. Yeah, in the back. Good morning. Adam Sachs, Brown University. Just a question about um, distressed populations and what kind of accommodations are made in terms of working with students who are have a distressed profile in terms of public health, in terms of accommodation and disability most of all. Yeah, um, I, I, won't, uh, I won't claim to, to have all of the uh, perspectives on that question, it's an important question. Um, as, the, as the day goes, maybe we can keep that as a thread. I would, I would say that uh, in the local organizations that I referenced, I, I think the, um, the very sort of core of our missions is about uh, making artistic experiences and arts education possible for folks who are in distressed situations of various types, right? Whether that means um, uh, living with a kind of uh, threat of violence or, a, um, or homelessness. Um, and I think there's some very specific work going, or going on in the arts around disability. Uh, I don't know if anyone is here from VSA Arts, but that's an important advocacy and um, networking organization thinking about issues of disability. I know at Community Music Works, um, we have sort of challenged ourselves as educators to accommodate different disabilities as they come. So not that we claim to specialize, but um, students who have come in with a who are blind or who have uh, physical disabilities, just trying to figure out how we can keep the door open. In the uh, back up here. Um, thank you for the mention of WPA. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that it brings up is when art enters the real world. So when you go from painting Madonnas and Marie Antoinette to taking photographs of migrant mothers, a whole different set of issues about who gets to represent whom um, becomes available and up for discussion. And I think a lot of what's in the course could help organizations to really think about who gets to report, who gets to speak, whose music is on YouTube, all, all of those kinds of things. Thank you, Denny. Maybe the uh, final word from Stefan over here. Hi, thank you for all this, all of you. Um, it, it seems like it's important to convince or educate people about the fact that music and performance and art creation is politics and often it's those who are interested in politics have to be educated or encouraged to understand that the politics of art um, do you 
to what degree do you find that you are educating musicians or artists that what they're doing is actually politics? So the other way around. The reason I think about this is my grandfather was brought before the House and American Activities Committee. And the fact that under McCarthyism, it was artists, in, especially in Los Angeles, who were being brought up on trial for their political actions, just like Glenn Beck's um, attack um, on the organization we heard of earlier, shows that there's an understanding from the outside that what, what self-proclaimed apolitical artists are doing is actually very much politics. Um, and my grandfather said at the hearing, you know, I, I'm not into politics, I'm an artist, which means I'm a humanist. So do you find yourself educating artists about the, the fact that they are actually engaged deeply in politics? Mm. Artists work by nature political. Um, I, I think rather than giving my own answer to that, if, if you don't mind, I think we can leave that question hanging because it's such a beautiful segue to the next panel, thinking about how artistic engagement is civic engagement. Uh, and, uh, and we'll pick it up there with, uh, with Heidi just a few minutes. Thank you, everybody.